Welcome to the Hypothalamic Amenorrhea Podcast. I'm Danny Sheriff, your host, certified fertility awareness practitioner, functional nutrition counselor, and founder of the HA Society, and of course, an HA recovery coach who has walked where you currently are walking. This is the place to come if you care about getting your period regularly. This podcast aims to educate, inform, and keep you motivated on your period and HA recovery track. So let's dive in. But last thing, nothing on the show should be taken as medical advice. So please seek the advice of your physician. Okay, so I have been talking a lot about the Restore program, the DIY program lately, but Ashley, Mishi, and I just decided that last minute we want to relaunch the live group program version of Restore just because we are seeing a need in the community. We are launching the Restore Your Fertility program, okay? So the difference with this one is that we are looking for a handful of women, four, uh, sorry, five, five to 10 max um, of women who are looking to recover to get pregnant. So specifically, your goal is recovery and fertility. And we're going to work with you for 10 straight weeks to get your period back and get you ready for conception, if not actually get you pregnant so this is really our bread and butter this is what we specialize in and we know that if this is something that you really want to do um that getting pregnant getting your period back is a top priority you're absolutely going to make serious headway with this program it's hybrid one-on-one and group meaning you will have the exact answers to whatever you specifically need. We still provide you with a custom protocol. Basically, we take you through that process as a group. You know, this is really like our one-on-one coaching, but at scale, taking you through the process together versus just one at a time. So that basically means you get one-on-one coaching for a fraction of the price, And we take you over 10 weeks and then you still get an entire year included of the HA Society for continued support and maintenance. So basically, you can't go wrong. You know, we are yet to see a woman um, with amenorrhea, you know, really be unable to recover. It's just, we just don't see it. It's not in the science and In this process that we have done over and over again, we have seen women who seriously doubt their ability to succeed recover, like quickly. So if you are, you know, talking your partner's ear off all of the time about this and you need a different perspective and you need an expert opinion, this is definitely a program for you. And more so if you feel like recovery is taking over your life, right? Like, oh my gosh, you think about it when you wake up, when you go to the bathroom, every time you have to eat, it's overwhelming. Should I try this? Should I try that? Let me Google this. You know, this program is definitely going to be right for you because it's going to take out all of the questions over 10 weeks, one hour a week. You'll learn everything you need to know in order. And because there's that Um, group element where you get to talk directly to us and communicate with us you can really truly understand what what applies to you and what doesn't so that you can go and follow the plan and implement without questioning it constantly without you know bombarding your husband with like your fears and concerns it's really designed to help take the stress out of this process put you on track and make sure that you feel completely comfortable with the process so that you can put it in the back burner let it run on autopilot and just live your life so if you want in on this um program go to the hasociety.com forward slash restore dash june that's restore dash june if you just go to the website you know you'll Um, You'll see it in the navigation bar and apply. And if you do have lab work for us review, a part of the application process will be helping with diagnosis, making sure that 
um, you you sort of have a second opinion and some information and we can't legally diagnose, but we can certainly show you, you know, based on the labs, like this is what we look at, this is how we identify it. So if confirmation um, and clarity about what you're working on is also a piece for you, um, I highly recommend that you consider our program. You know, we cannot wait to hang out with you. It starts June 14th. Um, and applications will close, at, you know, once we basically had all of the spots filled. So get in quick and we'll see you guys there. Okay, on with the show. Hello. Welcome, Mishi. How are you? I am fantastic. Great. Ashley, how are you? I'm good. I've come up from the dead and I'm here. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> from My your day. whack week of work. Yeah, my just intensity. Yeah. This is like a thing that we're all going to have to resolve. And I think this is relatable to everyone that I think about this all the time when we go for a vacation. And so we just try to do a week's worth of work on either side of the vacation. And I'm almost like, I don't know if that's truly the point. I feel no, like, <laughs> I feel like it should be like, no, like you didn't have to do whatever work would have been done in that week. <laughs> Well, I think but it's very hard with, yeah, I think that's with like entrepreneurship is that like when you don't have, I, yeah, no, no, I've thought about this multiple times. Like, like whenever you, I don't know, maybe not everyone's job, but like whenever like you go away, either like the job continues without you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, uh, teaching or being a nurse or a doctor, like people still got to, you know, do their thing. Yeah, it would just be nice to have the resources. Well, it, well, <laughs> it's just like, an hey. mind exercise, you know what I mean? I do. I do know what you mean. But no, work must go on. And with that, we podcast today with questions from people. Y'all have been doing a great job of sending the questions through both the Instagram DMs and the YouTube DMs, my preferred pipes. So if you guys have a question, please do also send them through there. We like answering them as a group. Um, and let's see how many we can get into guys before the inevitable, do I have to gain weight and or stop exercising question? I bet it's, it's a way one. in. It's okay. It's well, let's see. Go. Let's go. Let's do it. All right. Eva asks, hi, I've recently found you guys on YouTube and you've been super helpful so far. I'm trying to recover my period. I am currently experiencing some spotting, extremely light period, and thinking it may be an anovulation or an ovulatory period. Is this a sign of progress? I haven't seen any kind of bleed for almost 12 months and started to really focus on recovery two months ago. I think that's a great question. I get a lot of anovulatory questions. So I feel like we should just talk about um, cause I also spoke about this to someone yesterday too. How do you know if it's an anovulatory bleed? I feel like is the question or how do you know if this is like the real deal? So side note, I just had three clients have an ovulatory bleeds this week, which is progress when you haven't bled for years upon years, upon years, upon years, upon years, upon years. Upon years. Um, so I'm super pumped about that, but yes, it's actually not as uncommon as people think. And I, and I, I mean, so I'm interested in y'all's opinion. I think it could be a very encouraging sign, um, early on in the process and it's not as, um, like bad. It's not ideal, but I don't think it's as bad as people think it is. Mishi, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I, I don't agree. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing. I would see it as a progress marker. I think we just did a post on this maybe like a week mm. ago. Yeah. So, and it's funny how um, anovulatory bleeds are not as uncommon as you think, but they're also not as common as you think. So it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, because they're, they're harder to spot. So for anyone who's wondering, an anovulatory bleed is where you have bled, but you have not ovulated. So you can bleed and not ovulate, but you cannot ovulate and not bleed. 
you know, you could have a really light bleed or some, just some spotting, but you know, so this is definitely very common with like the first period, um, because you're starting a menstrual cycle from a dead stop. So we can often expect things to be like kind of whack, um, and the body to just be like, blah, (laughs) something like, let's do something, you know? Uh, and so it might result in something that looks like that. Um, and anovulation is also common in like the unexplained infertility space. It's like, oh, you're not ovulating, but we just don't know why. Um, and so we're going to put you on like letrozole or clomid or force the ovulation to happen. Um, you know, it's definitely known in the infertility space um, as a thing. And it surprises a lot of people. Like I've had women be like, who, who got pregnant using treatment who were like, well, t- did you know that? you cannot ovulate. (laughs) So it definitely like shocks people. Um, And the way to basically diagnose, confirm an anovulatory bleed uh, is first of all to bleed and then go back and say, I cannot see any evidence that I ovulated. And you cannot do this basically without charting, first and foremost. You can't, you cannot vibe an ovulation <laughs> so there's that right like you know because because that's common no They're like, you, know, you cannot vibe ba- based on what i saw with my mucus i don't think it was ovulatory like you really just don't know um you need that temperature shift sort of to to confirm it i mean unless you saw egg white cervical mucus every day until you bled but i don't think that's possible so there's that yeah I have like three examples. I quickly want to sh- like run through this. Like I have one client, um, this is her second in ovatory bleed. Um, but this was her second round with the HA and for, she just felt really let down by her HA recovery from multiple reasons. But one of the things is that she was like, I just didn't feel any better. And that was like my first cue to be like, Oh, I wonder if you weren't ovulating. And sure enough, this is her second recovery cycle and they're both in ovatory. So that lets both of us know, and we have enough evidence to show that her hunger is not wrong and we still need to eat more in order to achieve ovatory cycles. So that was huge. My second one is, um, my client who has type one diabetes, she just had her second in ovatory bleed. Um, and her, uh, doctors were like super pressuring her to go on birth control or HRT. Um, and so this is a huge win. Cause she's like, look, I'm bleeding. Y'all can get off my back now. Now I can really move forward confidently in recovery. So I think even before she was a little like, is it, is it not, is it, which we all are like, that's all of our stories. And so now she just knows that we have to double down on what we're doing and stay consistent to get the auditory bleed. And then my third one, which is so interesting. Anytime like our clients like recover, they're like, I think I have an injury. I'm like, you have no injury. Like this is blood coming out of your (laughs) vagina. This is a period, no injury. Like you didn't like, like, you know, like, did you fall off a bike? Like instead, like, does it hurt in there? You know, like, is there a like? I mean, did something else happen? Like, do we need to have another type of discussion? Like, are you okay? You know what I mean? They're like, no, no. I'm like, okay, well then, you are bleeding, right? And for her, we just had a massive breakthrough session where uh, we were talking about how she was still holding on to subconsciously, subconsciously holding on to maintaining her shape. And this one, she, she really had me fooled for a while, right? Because like, Mm. she was so good at hiding that everything was okay. And then like, we had this last session where I was like, we get into the layers lady. Like we've got to get to the layers of this boom, and ovatory bleed once like this all came out. And so again, yeah. in both of these situations, it's super encouraging because it's still early and yet it lets us know that we are on the right path. And now we just need to push a little bit harder with, you know, food or mindset because we're on the right track. Like, you know, like this didn't happen accidentally, but like, we're not there yet. So for this person's question, like, where are you potentially still holding back on? And that's going to be your next step between an auditory and auditory and 
yeah so I think it yeah. Be- yeah 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 I totally sorry. I totally agree kind of like with Ashley like I was very similar to your client and I also have other clients who are I think I think that's just like part of the phase and like a natural progression of letting go of like certain subconscious restrictions and things of that nature. But I was the same way because I was low carb for gosh, whatever. And that's what I was holding on to. And I just wasn't eating enough carbs calorically. Maybe I was needing what I ne- I needed, but like my energetic needs were not being met because I was still so low carb. The moment I added in carbohydrates, I started ovulating. So I had a first anovulatory cycle, then I added in carbohydrates. And I also do agree with you too, Ashley, as far as like, I think that's the evidence that they need that's going to push them. And then it's also going to help them see like, oh, like this thing that I don't want to let go of is probably actually holding me back. So I think it's a good thing. I think it's a really, really good thing. Oh yeah. It's a a blood... Blood is better than no blood. Like we're in the right direction. You know, we cannot bleed without some level of estrogen production. So uh, that's like, that's black and white. So yeah, Eva, experiencing some spotting and even an anovulatory bleed is um, a good idea, but sorry, is it, is good progress, but we don't know if you, if you were anovulatory based on that alone. I hope that helps. Um, Okay. Weeping Kita asks, hey, lovely ladies. I've been suffering from HA for just over a year now after restricting calorie intake and researching and maintaining an underweight BMI. Although I've been attempting recovery for six months now, it's been more of a quasi state where despite my quote unquote high intake and reduced strength training, I haven't gained any weight. This is mainly due to me spinning my wheels after my doctors recommended me gain no more than half a kilogram a week, which has made me restrict and overthink calorie targets to make sure I don't gain too much. Do you have any advice on how to get over this fear of perfecting weight gain? As I seem to spend more time taking um, my total daily energy expenditure spreadsheets. Oh, I spend, I seem to spend a lot of time making TDEE spreadsheets and researching why underweight people don't need 2,500 calories than time spent actually gaining necessary weight. So in short, I know what I need to do, but I am stuck finding every reason not to do it. Juicy. so juicy wow okay yeah well so this question is advice on getting over that piece right so hmm it sounds like you know exactly what you need to do and i mean you you either need you perhaps you're looking for the like you're looking at the wrong evidence, you know, you're actively searching for your reasons to not recover um, or to why you're a unicorn, why this advice doesn't apply to you. Um, And you just quite simply need to dive in to like actively look for the opposite side of the coin, you know, just like the best way to understand politics is to read all of the, (laughs) you know, read all of the um, publications that are biased on both sides, you know, not just read one. And so like what you're doing is choosing what you're looking for, you know, and that's, that's super common. Um, but you're going to have to get a lot more curious because none of that is true. And this whole, like, make sure you don't gain weight too quickly thing seems like a, a doctor who is stuck in their own weird beliefs around weight. That's just me. Um, I just got an email this morning from one of my clients that it's a doctor's letter. It's like written in black and white. And I might save this letter forever, basically telling someone with HA and disordered eating to, because she has elevated um, LDL and cholesterol, which there's multiple, there's so many reasons, AKA, um, we just did a post about it. 
head, go back. Refer back. Head. It's from low estrogen telling her to work out more and um, avoid saturated fats. And I'm just like, <laughs> okay, right. And so one thing that I like to explain is that doctors are there to like treat and diagnose. And if they can't wrap this up in a bright, because think about like, you're there and they're not a coach. Like they're not, you ain't, like they're not going to follow up with you tomorrow. They're not going to hold your hand through the thought process and through the habit change and shifting beliefs. Cause that's not what they're there for. Right. So to the best of their ability, they're going to give you guidelines based on standard of care that may not actually be applicable. Right. So I think it's interesting, unless we haven't been fully uh, forward with our doctor that you are coming from a history of disordered eating or eating disorder, this doctor has gone ahead and said, please gain weight, but make sure you don't do it too fast, right? Which is so uh, counterintuitive for someone who has a poor relationship with food and their body. So I think that that's where we really have to, which it's hard in our journey, but my biggest question would be, how is that working out for you in your TDE spreadsheets? Are you any less obsessed with food? Are you trusting your body more? Are you eating to satiety? Are you doing the things that has been proven to restore ovulation? Um, and it's really tough, especially for women, for us, because think about it, some men. Okay. Side example. My friend's dad has a known heart condition and his doctor has told him to like take heart meds. And he's like, man, and just won't take them. Let's put him in the hospital. Right. But women were like, the doctor told me I must do it. So I think it's interesting, the men and women's different responses to medical advice first off. So there's that. That's just an interesting side note, but in this point of, is that working for you? It is controlling your body, your body composition and your weight, helping you further your healing in HA. And if not, is it possible that we may need to be open to a different approach? A huge thank you to Tempdrop for sponsoring this podcast. Tempdrop is a fertility awareness monitoring tool that I love. It's a wearable device which you can use instead of taking your temperature manually with a thermometer each morning. As you may know, we recommend the fertility awareness method both as you're going through recovery and 100,000% after you have gone through recovery as you move forward for the rest of your reproductive years. TempDrop gives you everything you need to effortlessly track your fertility. You wear the TempDrop sensor while you sleep for accurate basal body temperature readings without the stress of early morning wake-ups. I personally love and need this because with a toddler, my wake-up times are all over the place and the occasional sleep disruptions are making the use of an oral thermometer increasingly more difficult. TempDrop's accompanying charting app enables you to track an array of symptoms alongside your BBT including cervical mucus and OPKs, and even gives you sleep insights. Combine these fertility signs all in one place to identify your fertile window, confirm ovulation, plan for your period, or identify pregnancy. Whether you are trying to conceive or avoiding pregnancy, or you want to chart your fertility for health reasons like HA recovery to see where you're at in the process, TempDrop makes fertility awareness accessible to all women, even if you don't have regular cycles or sleeping patterns. Track your ovulation in real time with TempDrop. Get 10% off your order when you go to tempdrop.thasociety.com and use the code HASociety at checkout. Please support this show by using our link and our discount code. Get your TempDrop at the time of this recording and send us a screenshot of your purchase either via Instagram or you can email us danny at the hasociety.com having used our discount code HA Society, so it has to be in the screenshot to get your 10% off when you send that to us 
we will send you free access to our fertility awareness method for HA course. Again, that's tempdrop.thehasociety.com and use HA Society at the checkout to also get access to our course that we usually sell. And one more thing to sweeten the pot is that you can put this 10% code on top of any other pre-existing sales they're doing. So I know that they're doing um, regularly 15% off and 20% off sales. And so if you go specifically to tempdrop.thasociety.com, it will apply an additional 10% off to whatever sale is going on. So you can't lose, you get the temp drop, you get probably multiple discounts and you get our fam course. So definitely check it out. And again, support our sponsors so that we can keep giving you this show for free. Thanks. So that's kind of like what I would just say, because that's just a very thick question that I feel like I could apply that to each point, but maybe I'm missing something. So no, I think you're, you're pretty spot on because literally everything that you said, I was going to say, but like, <laughs> I would just like kind of expand on your idea a little bit and just like give my own two nuggets of like from the doctor's perspective or anybody that's giving you any sort of advice that's telling you that, you know, the HA recovery route um, is the wrong route to be going. I think it's just, they're projecting onto you their own fears, their own beliefs, their own um, like definition of what health looks like and, and what you should be doing for your own health. So I just feel like taking their, well, don't even take their advice. I was going to say, take it with a grain of salt, but I wouldn't be taking their advice as like what you should be doing. And also like Ashley nailed it when she said, has this been working for you? Like so far, if it hasn't been working for you, it's stressing you out. It's not getting you any closer to your goal or to, bettering your relationship with yourself, your body, all the things. Like, I just don't think that this is something that you would continue to to pursue. And my advice would to be like, well, I'm giving you the permission to let go of this and just see how it works for two weeks of just like letting go of the reins, just doing what feels natural and what feels good. And just going with the flow, getting out of your masculine and like going more in a flow state with what you feel like you should be doing. Feel like you should be doing which I think you know what you should be doing you know and another thing I like to point out I kind of went on like a a big rant on one of our community calls but I think it's really interesting the masculine approach that we're taking to a feminine function I'm gonna work this out with my spreadsheets <laughs> rather than so 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 again like relying on the external rather than pausing and asking yourself, are you hungry? Are you full? Do you know what full feels like? You know what I mean? Letting yourself eat when you're hungry rather than when the spreadsheet tells you you can eat is, is absolutely feminine. Like, because we are look at that, you know, like we are truly tapping into our internal cues rather than outsourcing them to a doctor, to a spreadsheet and saying, well, my spreadsheet said that I can't do this right now. And that's a very masculine approach that almost every ha takes to it. I have yet not to see someone come in and full flow, like feminine energy and fully embrace it. Even the most surrendered people are like, but according to my timeline and I'm like, uh-huh, <laughs> what does your body think about your timeline? You know what I mean? Um, Again, I think it's just taken a hyper masculine approach from a hyper masculine system and trying to force the feminine body to do something, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm just like, how is that going? And mind you, Danny and I have a million spreadsheets. So <laughs> we're not, so we're, like, we're not knocking your spreadsheets, but we have a million of them and we love them and we love the tab section. But I'm saying like, you ovulating is a feminine function. Mm-hmm. Hey, I think there's a time and place for spreadsheets and for the masculine. So it's not like oh, yes. a bad thing. It's just like, this is not a process that can be done in the masculine energy. You're just going to oh, have to, to own mm-hmm. into some, may I say surrender? <laughs> I feel like that's a trigger word, but surrendering a little bit and getting more into a flow like just do what feels the most natural I know it's tough but that's that's what it's going to take yeah 
Yeah. I mean, if you're trying to resolve your amenorrhea by using mathematical equations, you, got, you might have a bad time. There's totally people that that works for. And they're like, oh my gosh, look, this wasn't that hard. And as we've said before, like they're not listening to this podcast. This is not those people, you know, we're not their people, but also show me their chart, right? Because, you know, show me that they're ovulating, show me that it looks good, but yeah. There's, uh, if you're trying to get your period back with obsessive tracking of calories, and if you're applying, um, like, I don't know, like morality as well to like those outcomes, you know, with charting and stuff, you're just, um, that's the mindset piece. It's a mindset piece. It's focusing on the wrong thing um, and wanting to focus on that because you're afraid to just like let go of the control it's like you you love it and that's what's hard it's like you're so much more comfortable in your spreadsheets and your charting and your apps um and if you were to just like let your body be who even are you you know you have no control how are you going to be productive how are you going to be seen as you know, this, like this picture perfect person instead of just some like non-athletic regular person who's just like letting their body just do whatever it wants to do. Yeah. Like there's judgments around what it means to let go of the control. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done mentally and emotionally, but for this person, you know, the best thing to do is, yeah, ask yourself, how's that been going for you? Um, and if you've been spinning your wheels, doing the same thing for months and it's not get, going anywhere, you need to change strategies. And those are what we recommend is chilling out about it. Um, okay. Just Tina. Hey, I have a question. I think I may have HA and I recently experienced some problems with constipation and an upset stomach. Can HA cause constipation IBS? If so, do you have any advice on how to relieve it? I feel like we've answered this question actually a few times. Um, so I probably have like a whole backlog of episodes for people to go through and find. But yes, um, it can either cause it or it can just be like another symptom of what is causing your overall HA, which is basically like undernourishment, overstress. Your body just doesn't have what it needs to operate on all cylinders. You know, HA is not happening in a vacuum. It's not just like the only thing that your body decided to downregulate and shut down was your uterus. And it was like, everything else is like top notch though. Everything in your body is probably on struggle street. That's just realistic. So it makes sense that your digestion would underperform. Yeah. And it also happens because whenever we reduce, and so just into deeper that, like whenever we reduce mm -hmm. our intake to chronically restricting our diet it down regulates t3 which is responsible for like gut mobility meaning that we tend to see um constipation we tend to also see a decrease in digestive enzymes which then causes bloating and which then can lead to you going to the doctor and getting diagnosed with ibs ibd we are not saying that you do not have a true case of ibs and ibd but almost every single person who has HA will eventually develop the symptom if it's not reversed. Um, and HA is reversible. So this is very, very common. Uh, we also see um, food allergies pop up um, or tend to get amplified along with multiple other things like hair loss, nail, dry skin, which we tend to not really notice the dry skin because we don't have any acne during this time because we have no um, oils being produced. But um, that's also a sign as well of chronic undernourishment. But most of all, not ovulating um, due to chronic dieting. So yes, it's all tied in together. Yeah, I don't have anything to add besides, did she say, I think I have HA? Has she, how oh, does she yeah. know that oh. she doesn't or does or doesn't have HA? Like what is the process of elimination that she's gone through to narrow that down? Yeah. 
yes. Lord knows. This is very common in anyone who reviews lots of coaching, coaching submission forms, such as us, right? We see that question. We have a question on our application form, like how sure, I think it's like, how confident are you in your HA diagnosis? And some people are like, 100,000% this is me. And then some people are like, I'm not sure. I'm still figuring it out. I have, or I just, I'm pretty sure I have this, but I don't have like a diagnosis from my doctor or I think I'm confused because I've been told I have PCOS. Now I'm hearing it could be this. So I'm not sure. Like there's a million ways that people feel unsure about it. Um, And I think that would it be great to like look at everyone's labs and just be like, yeah, normal, low, normal, low. This is you. It would be, but not everyone has labs. And in that case, for me, it's just like, if you resonate (laughs) with, anything that you hear you know on this show and you you haven't had a period for a long time and you have had one in the past I mean the writing's on the wall to me that's what I that's how I would that's what I tell people who ask that question but y'all might do it differently no same (laughs) I wonder if there's have you figured out a correlation between the people who are like "Mm, I don't know if I have it or not in the resistance to the process are those like more like the people mm, who are in like totally mm-hmm. i think that's such a good connection to me i do feel that way and part of why i love um looking at it on the submission form is it gives me I about what you think ash but it gives me a vibe of like that yes what level of resistance am i probably walking into not all the time some people are just like oh if you tell me that it looks like this is what I have, like, okay, I'll be on board. I just needed someone to say it who's seen it before. But yeah, it's definitely a solid sign of like, I'd rather it not be this. <laughs> so I'm going to sit in limbo because that's way more comfortable. Yeah, well, I think, honestly, I probably would have signed up for coaching if there was coaching back then. <gasps> Not, I mean, I, or I was just so unaware of it, but it wasn't for a lack of Google searching. I'll tell you that much. Um, mm-hmm. But back then I would have, I probably would have wanted to hear, but I wasn't willing to admit it. You know what I mean? Um, so I think it's a great question because yeah, you would have been wasting your time with me because I would have still fought you tooth and nail. Been like, nope, nope. I would have been the worst client y'all. Like, I'm just telling that. That's why like, I have no judgment with any clients because I'm like, I would have been the worst, the most insane, crazy client. So, so yeah. And I think it was the opposite. I did, I did work with someone, you know, and it was like, I did not want to do any of those things. And that's why I got, that's why I'm so passionate about what we do is because I was not going to take those steps by myself. Like I was not going to be one. I, I did know 100% that I had HA, but I did think um, I was more in the camp of like, I'm not small enough. I'm not sick enough. Like, I just don't think like I cannot justify. Um, I cannot justify allowing my body to do its thing. I think I was in between both Danny and Ashley, like you guys, I think I'm the middle ground, um, but I did. Mm-hmm. I did reach out for help and that was everything that I needed. So there is something Mm. to coach. Yes. Okay. Um, Let's see. You know, I have, um, I do have one other question, but I had a little note here in case we didn't end up doing questions that I wanted to just like be bop with you guys about. Um, So let's use this last, however long we have. 15 ish minutes um, to talk on this. Why you, the listener, so why you feel so confused about all of the different recovery stories? So here's the context. I'm, I frequently come across, um, I just get overwhelmed because I hear all of these different stories on all of these different outcomes. And I think, why can't I be like that 
that or you know and it's it's interesting and it's a hard spot because the goal of sharing people's stories on the show and anyone who shares them in any kind of way is to help you see some similarities in your story and kind of take what might apply um, and feel motivated and have hope and feel the sense of community and like you're not alone and that this all makes sense and all of these wonderful things. Yet at the same time, as I'm sure feeling those things, some people also feel like just it just comes across to me as confusion because what does it all mean that everyone's I don't know ha- seeing something different or that I'm not like I'm not having that exact experience and I just was wondering what you guys thought about that so my initial thought if I understand this correctly, is the frustration that you're not having that exact experience of someone that you've heard on a podcast or like a testimonial, right? Okay. Yeah. So I think that's, I love this question because everyone that I've even brought on the podcast has been like, man, I don't know how to fully tell my story because there's so much to it that it is physically impossible to walk someone through your entire story. Like I'm still remembering parts of my story. I think I blacked out y'all anyways. So you know what I mean? So you're like, every time I share my story, I still am not able to fully tell you the entire story because it was so tumultuous. You know what I mean? So one, you're never fully hearing anyone's story. And so you're hearing someone's 10% at best 30% to your full hundred percent. And it's never going to line up ever, ever, never, ever with everyone's best intention ever, never, never. You know what I mean? It's just not going to happen. So there's that Two, I think what people are holding on to, which not everybody is able to also share that or articulate that. Sometimes that takes years to articulate exactly what you were holding on to and why you were holding on to. And people's bodies respond differently to that subconscious holding on and not letting go and fighting against the body, right? It's always going to be different, right? And what I also think is that some people aren't able, I mean, I wasn't able to, fully articulate what they surrendered and what that did for them. Right. So you have all these things that you can't quantify and what we're looking for, because we're coming at it from a masculine is okay. There's a formula. I've repeated the big rocks. How come I'm not getting the same result? Right. And if this was a masculine formula only driven process, then yeah. I would be frustrated with you, but it's not. And that's why we have to take people's individual, like, what are you bringing to the table? And even if you were to bring the same thing to the table as somebody else, how you respond mentally, emotionally, and physically is completely different. So I think it's us having more of these conversations about the wide variety of how people respond to the same quote unquote stimulus is what we're not seeing and what we're losing sight of whenever we get frustrated with people's uh, recovery stories. And we're like, I'm doing the same thing. Yeah, I agree with that. That's how it was for me. Even when I I first went on the podcast as like um, a guest telling my story, I was like, I literally, it is so hard for me to articulate what happened because it's like after the fact, and it's like years after the fact, you can start to put words to the things that you went through. And Ashley, I'm like you, I describe it the same way. I just blacked out. I literally don't know what happened. Somehow I got say that a lot. Yeah. It's very, well, I feel like there's this part of like disassociation from your body. Um, so, and then coming back to your body that kind of happened later for me. Anywho, I think expanding on your thought, Ashley, I think there's a piece of uh, what comes in is like comparison is comparison and maybe a little bit of perfection that comes in of just being like, I think we're always looking for other people to, um, to, to see like the path that we should be going down to, 
should, what should we be doing versus like, we're always um, searching externally out for the answers versus like looking in internally. So I think that may cause a little bit of confusion for a lot of people too, because like they're looking out externally, they're doing comparison. They're trying to be perfect on their journey when it's all about them and mm. their own journey. Yeah. Yeah. That external validation every day that you're on the right track. So I needed, um, I definitely wanted daily validation in the thick of it. I was like, every day I need to be hearing someone say, I deserve this. I'm worthy of this. Like, this is, this is the path for me. I would dig and dig and dig for it. You know, um, it was, it was hard to find. And so I think if you are listening to a recovery story, that's supposed to be your nugget of motivation, but that story involves something that demotivates you. Like perhaps they got their recovery. They got their first cycle after four months, but you're actually five months in, you know, now all of a sudden this isn't the path you're meant to be on because you don't line up with what happened for them, you know, or you had to gain more weight than them, or they didn't have to fully stop exercising. You have had to. And so instead, all you're actually hearing is like, I failed at this, you know? So exactly what um, Mishi said with like the, the little bit of perfectionism and the comparison piece coming into it. And so we, I, the, this is why I wanted to bring it up because I wanted anyone who feels like they can't listen to another one of these because it's actually just discouraging them. That is not the point, right? And if there's just something about their story that's not lining up with yours, I think we just need to check ourselves and like our ego at the door um, and realize that nine times out of 10, maybe more, um, like the piece that you're clinging onto that you feel like is not validating you is actually so irrelevant to you. Like it's, it's not very valid most of the time and it's this like picking and choosing kind of like the first listener question we're sort of picking and choosing what we want to or what our brain wants to cling on to and ignoring all the similarities in the story or all the differences in the story that are relevant well I think we subconsciously go into listening to these things of like okay they recovered I didn't so I'm going to find the difference does that make sense? Mm. You know, like we're going in with this filter of like, I have to find the missing piece. So, you know, which makes sense. I get it, which makes sense. But somewhere down the line, we go in this with this with this intention of finding the missing piece. And instead, we lose focus and we compare ourselves and be like, well she gets to work out and I'm not, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden we go into like two-year-old tantrum type of like vibes, right? Instead of going in there with our initial thing of like, okay, I'm going to find the missing piece. So whenever they share, I had to let go of how I cared about my body. Like Danny was saying, we gloss over that because we're not even willing to entertain that. And instead we latch on to, well, she gets to exercise and I don't. And now I'm upset because my story's different. Right. So, you know, like we're going in there, cherry picking the things that we want to take to heart and the things that make us comfortable because we have this deep loyalty as humans to remain as comfortable as possible. And so therefore anything that makes us uncomfortable, we're not willing to really explore. And hence why coaching is so effective is because like your coach will bring up those areas that you have been wanting to avoid or have allowed yourself to avoid, justify, make an excuse, do all the things that's keeping you stuck. Right. So it's really like going in with like a massive blind spot, cherry picking, feeling like it's unfair and wanting to justify as if that combination of emotions is going to ever produce something positive. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, not, you know what I mean? And we all do it, you know? So it's not just a you thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm 
Yeah. I feel like if you're going to do that, like overcome that on your own, that's where it's like, you have to journal. Like you have to coach yourself through this because if you're just, if you're just like letting yourself stew in these stories and emotions in your head, it's going to blow up and grow and just cause more anxiety and feel really, really real and get more stressful. So you really need to take time out daily to like sit with those thoughts and those stories. You know, we had um, uh, everyone on this call. We all know Nikki Chapman. I think early on um, when she was first going through recovery, she had this great tip that I've loved ever since. Um, which was she used to sit down, I think every morning and write out every negative, bad thought she's had about herself um, to just get it done with, (laughs) get it over with, put it out. It's out now. Um, And what I love most about that is that now you have, you have to look at it um, real quickly. You put it on paper and you have to look at it and you have, you have to tell yourself without a shadow of a doubt that that is not crazy talk. Because i tell you right now, like most of the stuff you're saying about yourself is inane, insane. Um, and, but you're just like believing it because that's what we do. The brain is so interesting like that. So yeah, if you find yourself in comparison, write it down. Yeah, the brain always wants to be right because it wants to like, conserve as much energy as possible so it's not going to come up it, so if you are thinking a thought about yourself it's going to find a way to prove it to you so that's just the way that our brains operate we're always trying to conserve energy and be the most efficient human beings possible so yeah like danny said write that stuff out and anytime i went back and read like old journals like i literally just like I laugh at the things that I said because they were like bonkers crazy. It just sounds like ridiculous. Even if you just voice them out loud, they sound really wild. Well, I think that's why I tell my clients to like, no, no, no. Don't just say this in your head. Say it out loud because your ears need to hear your own voice in order for this to be like, hold on something. You know what I mean? One thing that I've been working with clients lately is about like going through recovery and having to be at events. And, you know, Danny and I have shared about like our picture era where I opted out of it. And Danny was like, you can take my picture, but I'm not looking at it. So just two different approaches that I absolutely love. Um, but I was like, wait, what was that? Remember whenever we were going through our like recovery, I was like, no pictures. Like I, for like, for like six months just in general. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, I am opting out of this part of life and I don't care what anyone thinks. And, and your husband, Jake was like, no, these are important. So then you agree to take pictures, but you're like, I don't want to see them. And so I thought it was brilliant, two different things. And I was like, I'm just not entertaining nobody with nothing. You know what I mean? Anyways. Um, and so I was talking with her, I was like, do you think it's crazy that we all go to events so someone could be getting married, but yet every person there is worried about getting their picture taken, not even with the bride and groom, but they just want a bomb photo of themselves. And then I was talking about, uh, first off, that's actually not why you're there, but okay. Second off, we're so worried about how we're going to show up in photos, but I was like, don't you think that the person who took it, not you, is also so preoccupied on how they look in that photo that they actually don't care about how you look. (laughs) So I just want us to all admit that we're all at someone's wedding so that we can get a picture of ourselves looking fabulous. And then no matter how many pictures you take with other people, you actually don't care. You just needed a change of scenery and you actually only care about how you look. So I think it's okay if we opt out of that experience and go to the wedding for the reason of why we're there in the first place to support the two people actually getting married. And so I know this sounds crazy, but until we verbalize that that's what's going on, we internalize it. And that is why you're having one of the reasons why you're having massive distress during wedding season, recovering during the summer when Again, everyone's just concerned about how they look, that they don't care about you because they're too concerned about themselves. 
So you may be able to go to this wedding and actually be like, everyone's already preoccupied. They're probably already starving themselves, probably doing all these things that they're preoccupied with themselves. And so I'm just going to go about this event and do my thing, support them and then come home. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. I have a wedding at the end of the month. I'm going to try that perspective out. <laughs> yeah. Just I feel like like weddings are people. I'm so guilty of making a wedding about myself. <laughs> we all are. But no one that is so that. strange to me. Going to someone's wedding is like no different to just like going to dinner with all your friends. Like, what do you, why I do, I have regularly. Do it for the gram. Do not, it for the gram. I, it's that's so bizarre to me. And I watch, um, I love this YouTube channel where she does a lot of like bridezilla stories and like, am I the asshole stories? And um, they're, they're, they're hilarious to me, but they're also mortifying, like people not being invited to be in the wedding party because of how they look or like someone starting a fight with someone because she doesn't want one of the bridesmaids to be wearing glasses. She's like, can you, and the girl's like, I, I need to see. <laughs> and she's like, no, <laughs> it's because so it's about the like photos. It's, it's crazy. Well, that's so strange to me. That's so, it, it doesn't make any logical sense, but it's me. And okay, quick, am I the asshole story then? So a lot <laughs> of the ones that come up, a lot of the ones that come up are um, like someone, like the maid, the, the mother of the son, the mother-in-law wore white or, you know, or like someone wore white. So this comes up a lot. Now, my personal opinion is, if it's not a literal wedding dress, I do not understand. Okay. Like why we care so much, but here's the thing. <laughs> I was a bridesmaid in my sister's wedding. I was the only bridesmaid and I chose my own dress and it was white. <laughs> you are the person. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> There's so many other colors. There's like a million shades. <laughs> yeah. So my what sister didn't you make that choice. <laughs> yeah, so, so walk, I... us through, walk us through how how like how you were trying to be the bride. <laughs> oh, and it's, it's funny because I never even had a wedding. But I know um, it sounds like you had two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I think like in my head, I just wore this this like smaller kind of like a cocktail like dress like above the knees kind of just this like white dress and it was definitely very formal but it was you know it it was not a fucking wedding dress <laughs> and no one has ever in my entire life said anything no one ever said anything um I don't think my sister cared because my me and my sister are the same person um but yeah, I just saw it and I was like, you know, I would look cute, like a cohesive vibe. <laughs> <laughs> like, what if we were just cohesive? Like, what if I was like a little bridesmaid? Like, what if I was just like a literal bridesmaid? <laughs> Emphasis a on little bride. bride. <laughs> you said we're literally the same person. So I'm getting married too. Oh. Yeah. But I feel like, I just feel like someone should have said something. <laughs> well, yeah. well, I mean, I guess obviously if it doesn't matter to your sister, then like it doesn't matter, right? You know what I mean? Like I there was no, there was no world where I was stealing the show. You know what I mean? But like, because isn't that what people are concerned about? Yeah. I, I don't know if it's like a cultural thing since you're not from the States. Like, is that just okay there? Is that, or is that, is that just like a US rule, like a, an unwritten? No, I think, I think it's a thing in all Western countries. Yeah. <laughs> but I, like, I actually might just be a dick. So I watch these videos that I love laughing and being like, oh, that person's so psycho. But then every now and then they bring up the person that wore white and I'm just like, <laughs> you know like 10 years later I'm I'm out of nowhere feeling all this guilt <laughs> I should ask I should ask her about it yeah, I, I want you too, and I want to know what she says yeah I'll I mean I secretly so. kind of judge people when they wear white to a wedding like like oh, 
Don't you know better? Like, well, there's a million other colors, and you know that. I suppose if you're seeing the bridesmaid in white, are you assuming it was actually the bridesmaid, the bride's choice? Yes. Yeah. If so, then you might be like, hmm. Totally. Okay, but I, I assume she, else- I assume she ran it by her first, kind of thing. Yes. Like, as in, like, she didn't show up on the day of with white and, like, pulled, like, like, pulled one over on, like, the bride. Did I? Katie, like, I also did that. I, <laughs> no. Did I ask you if I can wear a white dress to your wedding? Or am I just an asshole? <laughs> All right. We'll find out when she wakes up in, like... Oh, She's probably on a different time zone. She's asleep, but we'll get it, you know, I'll post it to the Instagram. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, this has been great. Everybody follow the show at the HA Society. Me at Danny Sheriff. Ashley at Ashley dot Marie. No, Ashley underscore Marie underscore Smith underscore. And at Rose dot way. Underscore. Underscore. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, shit rose.way underscore wellness <laughs> guys i think everyone's in the bio at the ha society yeah. so if you just go there click away all right this has been great submit your questions we could do this again it's always really fun and we'll see you guys next week bye bye This episode is brought to you by Grassland Nutrition Beef Liver Capsules. Did you know that in terms of nutrient density, beef liver actually blows vegetables and fruits out of the water? If you're a client of mine, you have already been instructed to eat beef liver either fresh or in capsule form. I recommend it for anyone and everyone who is, of course, dealing with amenorrhea and fertility challenges out there, but I may even recommend it for just everyone in general. Get your husbands on it. Get your partners on it. If you have a history of HA and add on top of that, maybe a history of the pill, maybe you've been pregnant before, you know, through treatments or other, like you've just, your body's been through anything, you know, you're absolutely 100% dealing with a nutrient deficiency of some kind. And while it's true that testing is going to be the best way to understand those exact deficiencies, Eating nutrient-dense real food is going to be one of the most important next steps that you take with or without testing. So I've been using and recommending Grassland Nutrition Beef Liver Capsules for years now. And the capsule form makes it so easy to get your liver in every day. And I appreciate the transparency of this product in particular above others. So in case you're wondering, it's completely natural. This is freeze-dried beef liver in capsules. It's organic. It's made from Australian beef. And my favorite of their products is the liver with kelp because of the iodine from the kelp, which is important for overall thyroid function, which is often low in women with underperforming hormones. So rather than eat seaweed snacks every day, I get to take this beef liver with the kelp for my iodine. So if you're recovering or working on a fertility journey right now, do not skimp the nutrient-rich source of beef liver. Get 10% off your order with the HA Society and support your favorite podcast along the way. They ship to most countries, so you should be covered. Just go to grasslandnutrition.net and use HA Society, just HA Society, at the checkout for the 10% off. That's grasslandnutrition.net with the code HA Society. Thank you so much for listening today, guys. Please subscribe to the podcast. And if you could head to iTunes specifically and leave a rating or review, that would help so much because it makes it easier for other people with HA who are Googling around to find the podcast really easily. So if you do that, you're doing a service to all of the women.